Okay, hello everybody. So this is my final lecture on the molecular genetics module and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about model organisms. Um, so what I want to do today really is introduce you to the this motley crew here uh, which are the major model organisms on which our current understanding of um, well certainly molecular genetics but also I would argue biomedical science in general is founded. Um, what I'm going to do today is give you a little bit of a insight into why model systems are so important in biology and in scientific research before going on to describe in a uh, little bit of detail some of the aspects of each of these organisms which makes them useful uh, with regards to being a model system to study uh, biology and in particular molecular genetics. Um, <clears throat> what we have here is E. coli. This is a plushy toy of E. coli. I'm sure Dr. Ross dreams of finding this in his Christmas stocking every year. Um, the next organism, although it's not apparent from this pint of bitter that we'll be talking about, is um, yeast, in particular brewer's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is a strong model organism uh, with a strong history in, um, in molecular genetics. Uh, we'll actually go on then to discuss uh, Arabopsis, which is a plant, which is um, kind of the main uh, model system for plant biologists. C. elegans, which is an nematode worm, which is a really useful model organism for studying developmental issues. Drosophila, which has got a long history of genetic research. And finally, the um, common house mouse, which is about as good a model organism as we can get for the study of human disease. So the lecture outline will basically be thus. We're going to consider why we need model organisms, what advantages they give us. And then we're going to describe each of the model, model organisms I've just introduced in some detail and describe uh, some of the advantages that they offer and also some of the findings which have arisen from work carried out on these organisms. And we'll finish by just considering what the future is for model organisms in science, um, whether any new model organisms are emerging which may overtake some of these classical examples that we've got to talk about for the next 45 minutes or so. So we guess the learning objectives... Again, relatively straightforward, but in order to meet them, you're going to have to do a little bit of work. Understand the need for and role played by model organisms in biomedical research. And be able to describe examples of the model organisms that we discussed today and what advantages they offer molecular geneticists. So then why do we use model organisms? What purpose do they serve? <coughs> um... And what characteristics, moreover, would we like to see in model organisms that we're going to use in the laboratory to carry out research? Well, from the point of view of molecular genetics, we want to choose organisms, obviously, which are well suited to the study of fundamental genetic processes. And kind of the birth of this entire area, this use of so-called model systems, arose because of a desire to try and address su such fundamental genetic um, uh, processes and get to the heart of what was going on with regards to the transfer of genetic information. Uh, so there was a group of scientists in the 1950s um, that, um, uh, 40s and 50s that came together at a famous laboratory called Cold Spring Harbor which you can find on um, Long Island near New York City. It's a really nice place to go to a conference. I was lucky enough to go there when I was doing a PhD. It's very picturesque and it's been a very um, important site, Cold Spring Harbor, for molecular biology in general over the years. Back in the 40s, it's a place where a group of scientists made up of Max Del Brook, Salvador Luria and Alfred Hershey came together to try and decide on a model organism that they wished to use in order to study genetics. And the organism that they ended up deciding to work on was a bacteriophage, the T class of bacteriophage, um, in particular bacteriophage T4. Um, they chose this particular organism because it suited their needs. They could grow it rapidly in the lab in large quantities and it allowed many of the actual genetic and biochemical approaches of the day to be combined. So it seemed perfectly suited to their needs and therefore they chose to work on that actual organism. So the reasons they chose to work on it were sound but it's actually the result of several people coming together and choosing to work in a defined area that bore the most fruit in the long term because what actually happened then was that Cold Spring Harbor became a bit of a centre of excellence for research on bacteria Tash T4. The laboratory started running actual courses and um, groups 
to instruct other scientists how they could use this model organism to carry out research that they were interested in and effectively the first model organism and scientific community built around it was developed. And as you can see here, that's one of the key points which we've listed when we're, when we're, when we we're thinking about um, what's important with regards to the use of these model organisms. The community of scientists studying them is integral to their success as a model system. And that was exemplified by a bacteria to bacteriophage T4 and these guys back in the 40s. The advantages of obviously having a large scientific community are that you can share expertise, you can share reagents, and by doing both those things, research progress occurs at a far, far more rapid rate than would occur if everybody was just doing research in a vacuum, not talking to one another. The other thing, of course, that's important for model organisms is that they serve as a model for related species, or ideally for all species. So bacteriophages are very, very simple bacterial viruses, in effect, and probably the most simple organisms that you can work on. But with regards to actually how they transfer genetic information, the fundamentals of that are similar for bacteriophages through to higher systems. So from the point of view of working on that aspect of biology, they were a perfectly suited model system. Obviously, those bacteriophages wouldn't be well suited to more complex molecular genetic problems such as those which are unique to eukaryotic cells. In those instances we might need to use a more complicated um, model system such as yeast. So yeast as we'll talk about is the most simple um, eukaryotic cell and uh, it's been used to delineate many of the eukaryotic pathways which we uh, now know also exist in higher organisms such as mammals and man. Um, Yeast has been a great servant to our understanding of eukaryotic molecular biology, but it wouldn't be much use when we're trying to understand behaviour or developmental biology because it's a unicellular organism. In order to understand how um, multicellular organisms develop, we need to do research on a multicellular organism. And that's where uh, organisms such as C. elegans and Drosophila have come in and proven to be really useful. But obviously C. elegans is a nematode worm, Drosophila is a fly, and they share little in common with the biology of humans who are obviously mammals. So finally we have a mouse model system, which at the moment really is the closest thing that we can get to, um, we, uh, get to, uh, sorry, it's the closest thing that we can really use in order to study human disease in a, in a living organism. Um, there are differences between mouse and human, obviously, but the actual biology is very similar and the actual etiology of a lot of human diseases is consistent in mouse. Um, so this need for these model systems to be related and to share similarities across species is also fundamentally important. Okay then, so let's start with bacteria. So bacteria, and in particular E. coli, um, is probably the most researched organism uh, on the planet in regards to man-hours that have been put into trying to delineate mechanisms from this particular th uh, organism. Other bacteria are used as model organisms. Bacillus subtilis is a useful model org organism, but I'll be lying if I said that E. coli wasn't far and away the most popular and most widely used um, bacterium um, in uh, research circles. I believe Dr. Ross did his PhD on E. coli. Uh, other members of the faculty currently do research on E. coli, such as Dr. Fletcher. So it's still widely researched today, but certainly it's got a real strong place in the history of um, molecular biology and molecular genetics. Why are we interested in doing research on E. coli or in bacteria? Well, that's mainly the main reason we're interested in using these um, organisms is that they're simple. Simple unicellular organisms that are easily grown, yet contain all of the machinery necessary for DNA, RNA replication and protein synthesis all tied up in a convenient bag or cell, so there's no nuclei to worry about like there are in eukaryotic cells. So it's a nice simple system that's easily grown and manipulated. Um, the first molecular biology really was carried out you know, using bacterium, uh, the work of Luria and Delbruck back in the 1940s, and um, it was their work really that alerted people to the fact that bacterium were also um, working under the same principles of genetic inheritance as higher order organisms. Now that might seem 
like a bit of a obvious statement these days, the fact that bacteria have DNA and, you know, contain genes, etc. But back in the 1940s, it was these things weren't, weren't particularly clear. I mean, they're not clear to some year one students. I think one of the questions that we ask year one students in DPS1 is whether or not bacteria have the same DNA as humans. And um, I would say one out of every three students um, with confidence answer, no, they don't, the, but the DNA is different. Obviously it isn't, the DNA is universal. And it was the work of Leary and Delbrook that showed that bacteria, like higher order organisms, are able to inherit traits um, through generations and these traits are prone to spontaneous mutation and alteration. Um, so this kind of paved the way for people interested in studying Mendelian genetics to use bacteria as a model organism to study those kind of events. Um, furthermore, they're useful for the study of genetics because they contain haploid genomes. That means that it's relatively easy to study the phenotypes of mutations, including recessive mutations in bacteria. Um, and also another facet of E. coli which is particularly useful is they have a strong and well-established mechanism for the exchange of genetic material. And that's based upon this so-called fertility plasmid, or F-plasmid, which is depicted in these diagrams here. So there are three possible ways in which E. coli can transfer genetic information courtesy of the um, F-plasmid. And that is, um, firstly, via just transfer of the plasmid itself. Um, so an F-plus cell, which is a bacterium, an E. coli cell which contains the F-plasmid, can actually interact with an F-minus cell, an E. coli cell lacking the plasmid, and transfer this DNA plasmid between the F-plus and the F-minus cell using something called a pili. It's like a long procession which comes out of the bacterium. There's a second and very important way which can the bacteria can also use to transfer this information. That's via these so-called HFR strains, or high-frequency recombination strains. And these strains are generated when the F-plasmid actually recombines with the genome of E. coli. And what that causes is a situation where the actual genome of a HFR strain can be transferred courtesy of the F-plasmid element that's contained within the genome across to a recipient cell, an F-minus cell. And this is a really potent way of exchanging chromosomal genomic information between bacteria. Final example of transfer with the F-plasmid, an important example is the um, F prime plasmid and this is where the actual fertility plasmid, the F plasmid, contains a small segment of chromosomal DNA which is then transferred along with the F plasmid from cell to cell. So this is a really again useful way of uh, being able to transfer genetic information from one bacterium to another. Uh, the example here is a transfer of the lactose um, operon from one bacteria to another bacteria. So there's, in, there's inherent usefulness in E. coli um, itself with regards to um, act, it acting as a model system to study genetics. Um, but obviously during, um, or over the years I should say, sorry, the actual manipulation of this bacterium as a, as a means of carrying out genetic research has really you know, progressed at great, at great rates. And perhaps one of the most frequently used um, methods now which involve uh, E. coli is the actual construction of recombinant DNA and recombinant DNA cloning. So you've been doing a lot about recombinant DNA cloning in this module and also in the practical classes that you've been you've been uh, attending. Um, the first ever recombinant DNA plasmid was generated from an E. coli plasmid called PSC101. So this is a naturally occurring E. coli plasmid that happens to have a single unique ECOR1 restriction enzyme site within the actual plasmid, which facilitates the cloning of heterologous uh, DNA um, into this E. coli plasmid and then the transfer of that plasmid into bacteria. Uh, subsequently, obviously, we've now developed artificial, if you like, prokaryotic expression constructs such as the P blue script constructs which you've been um, working with in the practical classes. Many of you now have done that second practical where we've considered um, directional cloning etc in P blue scripts. It all originated in E. coli with this PCSC101 
vector. There are also very powerful established biochemical um, techniques available for E. coli. Perhaps the most pertinent to molecular genetics is the ability to express proteins, both bacterial proteins and foreign, if you like, or eukaryotic proteins, to very high levels in bacteria, and then utilize um, affinity purification techniques to purify those proteins away from the bacterial proteins. So but E. coli and bacteria are a really powerful model system for studying just protein expression and ultimately protein structures, um, courtesy of expression of um, proteins in, in the bacteria to, to, to very high levels. Um, in more recent times, perhaps techniques which are more associated with eukaryotic and mammalian cells, such as immunofluorescence microscopy, have been uh, utilised in uh, bacterial model systems. So it's possible to do the same type of immunofluorescence microscopy that you might expect to see in human cells on bacteria, even though the bacteria are very small. Uh, the actual figure down here is an example of an E. coli cell which has been labelled with uh, something called FISH which stands for fluorescent in situ hybridization. You might have encountered this already. This is a technique whereby you can fluorescently label particular regions of DNA. And these two green blobs either end here of this um, dividing E. coli cell represent the origins of replication from duplicated E. coli genomes. And experiments using fluorescent in situ hybridization showed for the first time that the actual origins of replication in the duplicated bacterial genomes fly apart from one another to opposite ends of a dividing cell um, following DNA replication. So bacteria, whilst they've been around for a long time and um, were involved in a lot of the classical experiments, are now also being used and uh, being utilised, uh, modern te techniques have been utilised to try and, you know, um, keep the research on this very important model organism current. Um, it's important to realise that without bacteria, as much as it pains me to admit this, without bacteria there would be no molecular genetics. So I'm not a big uh, advocate of bacterial molecular biology and bacterial genetics. I much prefer the eukaryotic molecular biology and genetics. I make no secret of that, but I, I have to hold my hand up and say that without bacteria we, we wouldn't have molecular genetics as a discipline. Got to remember that it was because of bacteria or research on bacteria that we were able to confirm that DNA is actually the genetic material, so the work of Hershey, I tell. Mieselson and Stahl showed that semi-conservative replication of DNA occurred, and they showed this by working on bacterial um, systems again. The actual discovery of the genetic code utilised bacteria and bacteriophages, and even fundamentals under our fundamental understanding of how gene expression is regulated was also um, in large um, initially illustrated by the work of um, Manu, um and his co-worker whose name I have forgotten. So, so it's really the entire, um, if you like, back history of molecular genetics was initially mapped out courtesy of research carried out in bacteria. So moving on from bacteria then and away from prokaryotic model organisms to eukaryotic model organisms and um, to start with yeast. So the first point is yeast is a eukaryote. Emblazon that in your mind uh, forevermore. Yeast is not like bacteria. It's a eukaryotic organism. It's a very simple unicellular eukaryotic organism but nevertheless it is a eukaryote. It has a membrane bound nucleus. It contains all the organelles that our um, cells contain, such as mitochondria, um, even has basic modifications to chromatin structure, etc. So it's very, very similar in a lot of ways to our cells, at least at very fun a fundamental level. And it's for this reason, really, that people really started getting interested in using yeast as a model organism. Nothing to do with the fact that many of the yeasts are also used in the brewing process to make alcohol. So really the two most widely studied model organisms from a yeast perspective are the standard baker's or brewer's yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae and the um, not so common um, fission yeast uh, Schizosaccharomyces pombi, um, so called uh, after the African beer pombi. Um, both of these organisms, yeast organisms, have been used for many years and have both made really important contributions to our understandings.
current understanding of molecular biology and molecular genetics. Uh, I'm going to focus on cerevisiae, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, in the example I talk about today. Um, if you want to read a little bit more about the work of done in uh, Schizosaccharomyces pombi and the type of organism that is, that's fine, but for the purposes of this module and for this lecture, we're going to focus on cerevisiae. Uh, just to mention that people do do work on more clinically relevant um, uh, species of yeast, such as Candida albicans and things like that, but they're not really considered model organisms. They're, people are researching those because they're important pathogens, similarly to why people research certain bacteria because of the pathogenic nature. So then what are the advantages of working with yeast? Um, well, again, they're very simple unicellular organisms, but in this instance, obviously, eukaryotic organisms. Um, but whilst they are eukaryotic in nature, they share a lot of the, sim a lot of the actual similarities with bacteria with regards to how we can grow and culture these things in the lab. So they're easy to grow in simple media, have a short doubling time of around um, 90 minutes to two hours. Um, yeast has... A relatively small genome and uh, in the case of Saccharomyces cerevisiae this has been extensively studied and delineated in fact the, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae genome was the first eukaryotic genome sequence to be completed in 1996 so just prior to my PhD um, which was on Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, the entire genome of that organism was was published so um, that was an interesting time to be going into that particular area first time nothing was uh, unknown anymore we had the entire genetic map of the organism um, Cerevisiae has got very powerful genetics and biochemistry associated with it so we're able to do a number of really um, powerful genetic manipulations to the organism and we're able to do quite advanced complex and powerful biochemistry with the organism as well so the two images on the right here, just to tell you what these are briefly, this is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is also known as budding yeast. Uh, these small green, these have been false coloured here. The, the, this is a G1 cell, G1 yeast cell, it's like a spherical shape. And um, I don't know if you can see this here, I think you're looking here at uh, a cell that's um, actually uh, undergoing uh, probably uh, mitosis or certainly S phase here. So as you can see, there's a spherical um, yeast cell and then this large budded region here. So this is where it gets its name, budding yeast. That's the other name, uh, anecdotal name for Saccharomyces cerevisiae, budding yeast. These yellow things here, these weird like acne-like protrusions on the cell surface are what are called bud scares. So every time budding yeast grows and divides, it does so via the production of, of a daughter bud, which eventually goes on to form the new daughter cell. So following cytokinesis cell division, that daughter bud is separated from the mother cell to, and then to give you effectively two new yeast cells. However, the actual point where the daughter is separated from the mother leaves these um, very um, visible scars on the mother cell. So you can, you can kind of age the cell depending on how many scars are present. So this is a cell which is divided numerous times, whereas this is a newly divided cell. It doesn't have any bud scars that we can see. So that's a useful thing initially with regards to just the morphology of the yeast cells. And there are other morphological reasons why Cerevisiae has a useful model organism that we'll talk about later on. It's important to also realise that yeast contains um, many of the higher order structures within the cell, which our cells also contain. In particular, tubular networks acting cytoskeletal proteins. And this is indicated in this immunofluorescence picture here which is actually of Schizosaccharomyces pombi or fission yeast called fission yeast because it divides via binary fission much like E. coli rather than this budding technique that Cerevisiae uses and as you can see here these are cells that are actually about to undergo um, mitosis the chromosomes are lined upon the metaphase plate of the cell and we have this very uh, ordered tubulin structure present within the cell um, along which these replicated chromosomes are about to start to separate so what makes Cerevisiae such a useful model organism then? Well, one of the things that's really um, useful about Cerevisiae is it, it can exist in both a haploid and diploid form. So it has both haploid and diploid life cycles. And this is extremely useful for genetic analysis. As we mentioned for bacteria, the fact that you're able to grow these yeast cells as haploid cells means that you can readily study recessive mutations or the phenotypes of recessive mutations. But similarly, you can also knock out essential genes in Saccharomyces cerevisiae in diploid cells um, 
because obviously there is a second copy there of the of the of the essential gene which means that the yeast will continue to grow so how does this life cycle work well briefly what we have here in this diagram is an example of a haploid um, yeast cell which will quite happily undergo haploid mitotic division so if you were to place a load of um, so-called alpha saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast cells in some growth media they would just grow uh, via um, mitotic division over and over and over again very similar to how bacteria will grow in culture however if you mix alpha cerevisiae cells with cerevisiae cells of the opposite mating type a then what can happen is you can get formation of what's known as a diploid cell so these two cells will f effectively mate form mating protrusions and fuse together to give you a diploid cell and this diploid cell is then capable of undergoing my uh, diploid mitotic division at which point you are dividing yeast cells which are 2n which have got both uh, a and alpha copies of the chromosomes present now the really interesting thing is what happens if you induce sporulation of these diploid cells so if you change the media conditions in such a way that it promotes these diploid yeast cells to enter a particular uh, type of growth um, called sporulation you actually form four new haploid genomes uh, which are resident within four spores uh, and importantly these haploid genomes are formed via meiotic division so we get recombination of genomic information during the formation of these four haploid spores during sporulation you can take these four spores and then separate them out to isolate individual haploid genomes individual yeast cells if you like to bring yourself back to a situation where you again have these haploid cells so it's possible to isolate recombination events and clonal cells back from diploid yeast cells which have undergone sporulation and meiotic division a second reason why yeast is such a useful organism for studying um, molecular genetics is the fact that it's incredibly easy to introduce precise mutations to the yeast genome via a process called homologous recombination. So this is indicated in this diagram here. So say for example we wish to knock out or disrupt a gene of interest which we suspect was essential for cell growth or was involved in a particular process. All you would need to do to achieve that knockout in, in Saccharomyces cerevisiae is to transform the yeast cells in a similar way to how you transform bacteria by a heat shock with a linear piece of DNA which contains homologous regions to the actual part of the chromosome you're trying to replace. So in this instance we've got regions here which are homologous to the flanking regions either side of the gene that we're interested in knocking out and replacing. In between these homologous regions, you would place a um, reporter or a selective marker, normally an antibiotic uh, marker. And what happens is, following transformation of the DNA, your homologous regions recombine with the homologous regions in the chromosome, flipping out the actual gene that you're trying to disrupt, and then its place, placing the selective marker, the antibiotic resistance gene. So what that means is that when you come to try and grow these transformed yeast on selective media, any yeast cells which are able to grow on media containing the antibiotic um, of interest must be yeast cells which have undergone this homologous transformation event, homologous recombination event, to generate your recombinant um, transgenic, if you like, yeast strain. So a very powerful technique that in real time takes one or two days to achieve in the lab. Um, same thing as we'll see later on to achieve in a mouse can take many many weeks so really quick powerful easy techniques available for manipulating the genomic uh, g genetic information of this organism one of the other real booms about working on cerevisiae as a model organism is the fact as I mentioned earlier that the actual cells alter in shape and morphology depending on their stage of the cell cycle so what that means is you've got a very easy way of determining at what point of the cell cycle the cell is at just by looking at the shape of the cell. So if we see a cell which is effectively spherical or unbudded, we know that that cell is likely to be in G1. If we see small budded cells, those cells are going to be in S phase of the cell cycle. Large, larger buds are likely to be in G2. And then cells which have got a um, daughter and a mother bud of around equal size are likely to be undergoing mitosis. And it was this very easy um, 
way of monitoring the cell cycle stage of Cerevisia, which allowed um, researchers such as Leland Hartwell and Paul Nurse to perform their seminal studies on yeast cell cycle mutants, which eventually led to the identification of the cycle-independent kinase um, proteins, which we now know are essential in all cell types, from bacteria through to um, through to our cells for the initiation of mitosis. So that's one of the other real big findings, I guess, which uh, yeast has been really integral in, in facilitating, uh, among countless others with regards to molecular biology. So there's many, 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 many um, molecular systems which were originally delineated in, in Saccharomyces cerevisiae or um, Schizosaccharomyces pombe. Okay, so another um, important model organism which has made some big contributions to the field of molecular genetics over the years is the plant um, arid, uh, uh, the plant whose name I can never pronounce, Arabidopsis, which is effectively a mustard-like weed, but has numerous properties which make it, again, a very useful model organism for the study of molecular genetics. It's actually currently the model organism of choice for anybody who's interested in plant molecular biology and certainly plant genetics for a number of reasons. Uh, one of the main reasons um, is similar to like we've seen for uh, bacteria and for yeast uh, Aridopsis exists both as a haploid or 1N um, cell and a diploid cell um, throughout its life cycle so it's possible once again to assess the phenotype of mutations in recessive alleles due to the availability of these haploid um, cells that can, that can be cultured the plant itself is relatively easily grown, uh, it's quite a short generation time, uh, but by far its most useful property is the fact that it is easily transformed with heterologous DNA um, by virtue of a bacterium which infects um, Aridopsis, the plant, and in particular a plasmid which is found within the bacterium that does the infection. So this plasmid is called the TI plasmid for tumour-inducing plasmid. And as the name suggests, expression of this plasmid in plants leads to the formation of tumour-like structures uh, in, the, in the plant cells. Um, this TI plasmid has been exploited really by molecular biologists over the years as a means of introducing with great efficiency um, genes, or, genes of interest into the Aridopsis genome. But perhaps the biggest use that's been made of this plasmid is not to introduce other DNA into the genome, but to disrupt the genes that are already present in the plant genome itself. So scientists have made use of the fact that this transformation process is extremely efficient to disrupt nearly all of the open reading frames that are present in the Aridopsis um, genome, uh, and therefore creating a really powerful catalogue of mutants which um, are useful for reverse genetic studies. The genome itself of Aridopsis is relatively small. It's regulated in part by small RNAs, which obviously we've learned a lot about in previous lecture. Indeed, RNA interference was very was first sort of observed in plants. It wasn't really understood at the time what um, what was being observed, but we now realise that the observations that were made in plants some 15, 20 years ago were the first actual examples of RNA interference in action. Um, the actual first example of a short interfering RNA was identified in a different model organism that we'll talk about in a moment. But the actual mechanism itself was first observed in plants. And another interesting feature of the Aridopsis model organism is that it's a very useful model for studying epigenetic changes. And remember, epigenetic mutations are things which affect um, gene expression are mutations which are hereditable and affect gene expression but do not alter the actual DNA sequence. So we're generally talking about post-translational modification of histone proteins, so the proteins that are responsible for forming chromatin with DNA, or modification, excuse me, modification of the DNA sequence itself by methylation, etc. And indeed it's interesting to note that Aridopsis is unique along with ourselves with regards to the fact that its DNA is modified via cytosine methylation. And when I say unique, I mean unique amongst model organisms. 
um, yeast, fly, and even mouse model organisms don't exhibit this type of DNA modification, this cytosine methylation that we ourselves exhibit. Um, however, plants do, and therefore a lot of people have chosen to use Horodopsis as a model system for studying epigenetic change in DNA. Um, it's also an interesting plant from an evolutionary perspective as it allows you to track uh, cell lineages which have diverted in the past on the phylogenetic tree. Um, certain aspects of um, plant biology share similarities to eukaryotic cells where others have diverged significantly from eukaryotic cells and Aerodopsis is often used to look at that sort of diversion in evolutionary biology. Okay then, so moving on to this little chap, um, the nematode worm C. elegans. So this model organism was actually championed and research into this model organism was set up by um, Sidney Brenner who was also integral in establishing the bacteriophage and bacterial model organism field back in the 40s and 50s so this guy was a real forward thinker with regards to model organisms and the reason he chose nematode worms or the reason he got interested in working on them was via a desire really to develop a model system in which he could study more complex aspects of biology, in particular developmental biology and organ formation and, and those sorts of things which obviously you can't study in unicellular organisms such as yeast or bacteria. Um, so he was looking for an organism that was easy to grow, um, simple to work with and ticked the boxes of um, having uh, simple cellular organs which could be um, studied. Uh, from a point of view of trying to understand developmental biology and developmental genetics and with regards to those tick boxes C. elegans um, fits the bill perfectly. So um, over the years it's become the model organis organism of choice really for developmental biologists and um, it's got a rapid life cycle, you can grow the worm from egg to a mature worm in, in f just under 40 hours. Um, it's very easy to deal with in the lab, it grows on bacterial um, bacterial lawns on agar plates, each bacteria. And the key thing about this organism really is the fact that it's got an incredibly well well studied and very detailed cell lineage map. So what I mean by a cell lineage map is that scientists have actually worked out the lineage of every single cell that makes up this organism. So from the EBJ it's difficult to tell, but this is a microscopic organism. It's very, you know, practically impossible to see this with a naked eye. And in fact the adult worm is actually comprised of just 959 cells. The amazing thing really of Spatsy elegans is that we now know where every single one of these cells is derived from with regards to developmental lineage. So the rather complex looking diagram here, the bottom left, is actually a lineage, cell lineage map of the neuronal cells found within C. elegans. So these are the, all the cells that make up the neuronal components and the brain such as it is and the, and the nervous system that exists within the worm and scientists know exactly where each of the cells was derived from right back to the actual zygote, the fertilised zygote. So there's no other organism where we've got that level of detail in regards to developmental, um, developmental uh, programming and developmental progression um, throughout the life cycle of the animal. Um, and this information combined with the techniques such as laser ablation of single cells provides a really powerful tool actually for studying developmental biology. So for example, scientists are able to, at different points through development, choose to ablate an individual cell in the worm and then ask the question, what consequences does that have on the actual development of the organ or the particular group of cells in general? So if you take out one of these early pre-generator cells that are gonna go on to make um, the neural networks up, what happens to the actual complete animal once it's mature? What aspects of the nervous system, nervous system have been have been um, disrupted via that um, deletion of the ablation of that cell? So that's a really interesting way of being able to work with an animal from a developmental biologist point of view. So C. elegans, as we've kind of alluded to in other lectures, is also responsible for really the description of some real key. Um, modern understandings and concepts in molecular biology and molecular genetics. So for example apoptosis or programmed cell death was first observed and described in C. elegans uh, by Horvitz and uh, what Horvitz was looking at was actually organ formation 
during development of the worm. And what he realised is that as well as cell division, obviously to create the new cells required for the organ, during pattern formation, during actual development of the organs themselves, there was also an ordered um, process of cell death going on so that the organs could correctly form with the correct morphology etc and, and the actual worm could develop into the adult animal and he described um, a series of genes called said gene CD um, of which said three appeared to be the key player which were responsible for mediating this program cell death and subsequently the um, said three gene was shown to be a homolog of other genes which were found in um, mama uh, mammals and higher order um, eukaryotes including humans um, and these Homologous proteins are, are now known to be the caspase proteins. So the caspase proteins are, are the proteins which are responsible for mediating program cell death, for actually doing the business end of apoptosis. And um, they were originally identified via work on, on C. elegans. So the second real key area that emerged from work on C. elegans then is RNA interference. So we've talked, obviously, in the previous lecture about small... Um, non-coding RNAs and how they enter the, the RNA interference pathway in order to affect mRNA translation. Well, that work was originally explained and described using C. elegans. So the first microRNA was actually described in C. elegans, the LIN4 microRNA. And since then, it's been a really powerful model organism for the study of RNA interference in general. One of the reasons it's so great um, at one of the reasons it's such a great organism to work with for RNAi, for RNA interference biologists, is the fact that it's so easy to actually artificially introduce these small non-coding RNAs to the worm. So you're able to synthesize, it's possible to synthesize short interfering RNAs artificially. Um, and obviously, by doing so, you can design these short interfering RNAs so that they can go target any, any mRNA you're interested in um, downregulating, interested in switching off. So it's a really powerful way of directing um, repression of certain genes for, uh, in, in research. However, it's often not very easy to uh, introduce these artificial short interfering RNAs into the cells. So, for example, it's much trickier to introduce them into human cells or to Drosophila or even yeast. But C. elegans is just very easy to actually work with re in this regard. You've actually got several options. You can inject the short interfering RNAs into the worm directly. You can actually give the worms a bath effectively soak them in an aqueous solution with the SARNA, SIRNAs and they'll absorb the SIRNA. Or you can even feed it to them. So you can, for example, clone an SIRNA expressing plasmid, um, put that into E. coli uh, and then grow the worms on these E. coli that, that are expressing your SIRNA. Now the worms eat E. coli, that's what they live on. So the worms will eat the E. coli bugs expressing the SIRNA and take up the SARNA in that manner. So you've got lots of different ways of actually working with short interfering RNAs and RNA interference with C. elegans. So it's a really been a really powerful model system in that in that respect. So another real strong classical model organism that I'm sure you've all heard of before is Drosophila uh, melangaster. So this is a fruit fly. Um, it's important you realise that these model organisms don't. You know, often they aren't. Uh, the, the, their origins aren't based in real logic or some um, apologies that's my phone going off while I'm just doing a podcast aren't based in any real logic they, they tend to emerge as model organisms just often by a by, by a chance or just because a scientist or a group of scientists choose to work on that on that organism as was the case of bacteriophage etc in the case of Drosophila some guys at Stanford decided that they wanted to try and um, discover or choose a model organism which you could use for the study of um, Mendelian genetics. So to achieve that, they placed a rotting fruit on the on the window ledge of, of, the, of where they were working mm. and waited to see which animals the following day were congregating in this rotten piece of fruit. And obviously there were numerous animals after a day or two that were found in, 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 this, pe in this peach. But one of them, uh, the one that they actually ended up choosing, was the um, fruit fly Drosophila. So Drosophila is a great model organism because like some of the other things, it's got a very rapid life cycle. Um, you can actually go from um, a larva to an adult fly in a day or two. Um, and one of the other interesting things during the development of the fly is the fact that on many of the appendages of the fly, so that the fly's legs, the fly's eyes, the fly's mandibles, etc., all originate initially from these so-called imaginal discs, which are flat disc-like regions of around 100 cells that eventually then, during development of the fly, give rise to that actual appendage, which might have many tens of thousands of cells in it. 
So these imaginal discs have uh, led to a much better understanding of how um, signaling molecules inform uh, a growing organism as to um, polarity with it, with it, within the actual embryo. So it's important that the hind legs of a fly appear at the back of the fly and not on the fly's head, for example. And how does the body know um, where to place these appendages during development? Well, one of the mechanisms which um, inform a growing embryo of where it should place different appendages and different parts of the growing animal is, um, a, is effectively a gradient that exists within the embryo of a signaling molecule, the most famous being sonic hedgehog, which is part of the notch signaling pathway. And um, all this understanding about the signaling molecules which exist as gradients in growing organisms and therefore lend polarity to uh, organisms during development originated from work done in flies and the Drosophila. The other big real leap forward that Drosophila afforded us was the ability to construct the first actual physical genetic maps on chromosomes. So there's a certain subset of cells in the salivary glands of Drosophila um, which undergo nuclear replication but don't actually undergo cell division. So what that means is you end up replicating the chromatids over and over again for the chromosomes until you end up with these chromosomes which are made up of hundreds of chromatids and are really, really large and actually almost visible uh, by a conventional light microscopy. So some guys took advantage of these so-called uh, polytene chromosomes, these large chromosomes, in order to construct genetic, physical genetic maps. And what they did is they used a certain stain to band the chromosomes with a pattern, similar to what you might have seen on karyotype analyses, um, and then looked at the pattern, uh, this, this banding pattern on chromosomes, where they knew that a fly had inherited a certain genetic disorder. So, for example, if a fly had inherited a certain mutation which led to the ch a change in eye colour, they were actually able to see a difference physically on the genetic map that um, corresponded to this change, and that might be a deletion of one of these specific bands here, or an insertion elsewhere. But importantly, it was the first time that scientists were able to correlate a genetic change that had been inherited um, and had been observed as a phenotype with an actual physical change on the chromosome itself. And that's, that's a key, key observation. Another important aspect of Drosophila is this genetic mosaicism that exists um, and it's a really useful aspect of the fly that enables us to study essential genes. What it means is that in the adult fly a subset of cells is actually mutated through a gene but the vast majority of cells is not. So whilst a gene might be lethal if you were to mutate it in all cells in the germline, it's not lethal if it's mutated in just a few of the somatic cells. But by mutating it in a few of the somatic cells, it can lead to an observable phenotype, which can inform then on the function of that essential gene. The best example here is a gene engrailed in Drosophila, which is involved in the in correct wing formation, wing, in development of the wing. Um, and what we see for engrailed is that uh, if you induce mutation of the engrailed gene by irradiating the fly during development, it's possible to observe a change in the, the phenotype of the developing wing linked to a mutation that's occurred in engrailed. You couldn't see that if you just mutated engrailed in the germline because the fly would never develop to adulthood because the engrailed gene itself is essential. A more extreme form of this mosaicism is observed in these so-called uh, gonadromorphs. Uh, and these are flies in which there's been an aneuploidy event very early on during um, uh, development in the zygote more or less where one of the sex chromosomes is lost in one dividing cell but not the other these cells then go on to be to form effectively uh, clonal replications of themselves and go on to develop the entire fly in such a way that one half of the fly is female and the other half of the fly is male so apart from being rather weird that's very useful if you're trying to assess the effect of um, recessive genes which exist on the sex chromosome which you might not be able to see a phenotype for if both copies of the sex chromosome are present in a female fly but will manifest itself if the remaining X chromosome in the male portion of this fly is the one that contains a mutation. So exemplified by the white eye phenotype here. So irradiating flies with X-rays to induce mutations like was originally done in the engrailed experiments, not a very um, precise way of, of trying to generate these mosaic uh, flies and uh, not a very accurate or a very um, useful way of studying uh, mutations via mosaicism so there's now actually um, techniques you can use which utilize uh, yeast recombinase protein called FLP and something a transposable element from Drosophila called a P element uh, 
whereby you can actually direct specific um, mutations within genes of interest. I'm not going to go into the details of that. If you want to read about that um, in the core textbooks, that's up to you. There won't be questions on FLP recombinase in the assessments. It's just you might want to read about that for additional reading, etc. Okay, so the final model of disorder I just want to talk briefly about is the common house mouse. Um, it's a very important model organism because it, of all the organisms we've discussed thus far, it's the mouse that's actually the most useful with regards to attempting to model human disease <clears throat> and then study um, the benefits perhaps of new drug treatments or try to delineate molecular pathways which are contributing towards the etiology of um, not only genetic diseases but other diseases as well. Um, so in that instance, it can be thought to uh, sit at the interface between ourselves and the classical organisms that we've been discussing thus far. Um, a good example, well, before I get on to the benefits of the mouse, I know there's a lot of controversy around using uh, mammals in particular um, in scientific research. It's not something I have any real interest in being involved in, uh, if I'm honest. However, the benefits of studying um, human disease in particular in mouse models is very clear. Um, a good example is the um, gene patched, which was originally identified in Drosophila and shown to be important in organ formation in Drosophila. And there's a homologue of patched in humans and in mouse. And um, in addition to the work going on in Drosophila, which showed that it was important in, in organ formation, researchers were also looking at the patched homologue from mouse, where it's also important in organ formation. However, working that model organism in the mouse also show that mutations in the patch gene can lead to cancer and the same is true at, it turns out for the human homologue as well so this is a good example of a fact um, that would never have been discovered by solely working on that gene in Drosophila scientists could have worked on a, worked on a patch gene in Drosophila till the cows come home but they'd never uncover the fact that the patch gene was also a proto-oncogene um, only by doing work in a different organism a higher order organism like mouse could that be discovered um, the most useful techniques which we apply to mouse studies really are transgenic techniques and these uh, techniques are well established, involve direct injection of DNA etc into the pronucleus of um, fertilised embryos which are then implanted into, into donor mice. But it's probably the actual uh, technology behind the so-called knockout mouse which um, defines the species as a model organism. So there are many, many, many. There's almost a knockout mouse for nearly every gene these days, actually. There's a company in Cambridge that's attempting to do just that. Certainly there's knockout mice that have been available for many years for some of the major genes involved in uh, human disease, such as P53, etc. I just want to talk briefly about how we actually go about generating these so-called knockout mouse models. Effectively, we um, utilise embryonic stem cells, which are originally derived from fertilised embryos, uh, very early on during development, the inner cell mass actually from blastocysts. So you have a fertilized mouse embryo that starts developing into a blastocyst and we isolate stem cells from that developing embryo. And those stem cells are then effectively exposed to linear DNA similar to that which was used in yeast really to promote homologous recombination. So this is an example of a piece of, homologous, a piece of linear DNA that would be used to uh, generate a knockout mouse. What you have here is regions of homology to the gene that you're interested in knocking out. And those regions of homology flank a marker, which is normally an antibiotic resistance marker, um, in this case, neomycin. Now, the important mm -hmm. thing, the difference between um, uh, the yeast system and the system used in mouse is that there's also this uh, second element, this TK element downstream of this um, cassette, if you like, that we, we want to uh, knock out the gene of interest with. And that's very important. Um, the reason that's important is there are two possibilities that can happen when uh, you actually try and create a transgenic knockout mouse. The first is that the actual homologous recombination goes ahead as planned. The regions of homology recombine with the regions of homology in the mouse chromosome in such a way that the gene of interest is completely replaced with this cassette here containing the, the neomycin marker, thus knocking out or disrupting that gene's function. However, there's a second possibility, and that's that non-homologous recombination takes place. And this is where the entire cassette just randomly inserts itself somewhere in the genome. 
And if that happens, you will still generate stem cells which are resistant to neomycin because you will still have inserted the neomycin cassette into the chromosome. But if this is occurring just at random, rather than the directed homologous recombination, which we see here, leading to just the replacement of the gene with this cassette, you will actually more than likely incorporate the entire linear piece of DNA, including this TK region. So what is this TK region? And well, it encodes for a gene from a virus, from herpes, herpes simplex virus called thymidine kinase. And what thymidine kinase does is it converts a, a drug called gansinclavir from an inactive form to an active form. The inactive form of gansinclavir is completely harmless to cells. The activated active form of the gansinclavir will kill cells. So it's a really clever system of um, determining whether or not the resistant, neomycin resistant cells, that you, uh, stem cells that you isolate following an attempted knockout mouse experiment contain a truly homologous recombination event and have definitely knocked out your gene of interest or whether the neomycin cassette is just randomly inserted into the genome. If it's a genuine recombination with the gene of interest, then the cells will be neomycin resistant and when the gansinclavir is added, they will continue to survive because the gansinclavir will not be converted and therefore is completely harmless. It won't be converted because there's no thymidine kinase present. Conversely, if random insertions happen and the thymidine kinase gene is present in the stem cell chromosomes, then when you add gansinclavir to these cells, the gansinclavir will be converted to the active form by thymidine kinase and the cells will die. So it's a really elegant way of developing knockout mouse mice that you know have an integration event in the correct location. Once you've actually got Neomycin resistant cells, which are also resistant to gansinclavir, these are then inserted back into the developing embryos of mouse. The mice go on to give birth to young, and some of those young will contain the actual knockout mutation in their germline cells. And it's those mice that we want because we can then use those mice to breed in order to generate, if you like, pure versions of that knockout um, event in all cells of the, of the subsequent offspring. So you can generate homozygous knockout mice. If it's a essential gene obviously that you're knocking out and you generate a homozygous knockout of it often the mouse embryos won't go on to develop into actual adult mice the embryos might terminate or die early on during development and so for that reason when you generate knockout models you don't just wait until the mouse is born and grown up to start analyzing it and looking for phenotypes and effects you actually monitor the development of the embryo all the way through to see if the gene that you've knocked out has a role in early development so just to finish with then, I want to talk a little bit about where all this is going next. So I alluded at the start of the presentation that there's changes afoot that are going to alter really, I think, how model, uh, certainly human diseases are modelled in the future. And these changes uh, really revolve around a, a new type of technology involving human stem cells. So there's a lot of controversy about human stem cell research that's been around for a long time. The reason being, like the mouse stem cells, in order to get hold of human stem cells, we have to isolate them from embryos. That means killing embryos, in effect, which is obviously very unethical. And for that reason, this kind of research was illegal in most countries for many years. However, all this changed about four or five years ago when a group in Japan showed that, uh, you know, amazingly, you can take a human skin cell and if you add certain genes, three or four genes, it doesn't take many, to these skin cells, it re these skin cells become reprogrammed in such a way that the evolutionary clock is kind of turned backwards and they revert from being a skin cell backwards through time until they're a pluripotent stem cell. So it's an amazing discovery that really has given birth to an entire new area of uh, science. That wouldn't, and there's a lecture devoted to this next year on medical genetics, but I just want to mention it at this point. Because with relevance to this lecture, what one of the real potential benefits of that is is you can take a patient's uh, skin cells, reprogram those skin cells to become pluripotent stem cells, and then cause those stem cells to differentiate into any tissue type you like. So this is a real powerful system for actually developing patient-specific model cell lines for modeling human disease. So let me give you an example. Imagine you've got an asymptomatic 25-year-old who we know because of a genetic test will go on to develop Huntington's disease in the future. Um, it's unlikely that that patient's going to be happy uh, for you to take a big slice off of their brain to start studying the changes that are going to go uh, going to occur due to this mutation in the Huntington's gene. However, what we can do now with produce pluripotent stem cells is we can get some of these uh, skin cells from this patient, reprogram them to, to stem cells, and then differentiate the stem cells into neurons or neuronal cell types in which we can then study the biology of Huntington's disease. 
So, you know, and that goes for other types of tissue as well, heart disease, kidney, liver, anything you're interested in. So it's a really interesting um, technology that we'll be discussing more next year, but I just wanted to mention at, at the end of this talk. So just to summarise then, model systems are essential tools in molecular genetics and molecular biology and biomedical science in general, actually. We've talked about a range of model systems that have been developed over the years from very simple organisms like bacteria through to very complex organisms like the mouse. And we've talked about the different advantages and disadvantages that these systems offer and the different sorts of discoveries that have been made using these systems. And just to get a little pretentious at the end of the lecture, I'll leave you with a quote from Jacques Manot, who was uh, one of the guys who started um, unpicking gene regulation using bacteria E. coli back in the 60s and 70s. And what Manot said is that if we understand the biology of E. coli, then we will understand the biology of the elephant. And I hope this lecture is going to show you that very simple organisms have got a lot to offer with regards to understanding complex uh, mechanisms in more complex organisms such as ourselves. Okay, so that's the last podcast for molecular genetics. I hope you find this series of podcasts useful when you come to revise this module. Cheers. <laughs>